Good afternoon. I said on my video today, recording the Mass uh, Bible readings and um, for today, the Saturday the 1st of October, that I was going to share with you the story of Leonard Peltier's 46 years in an American prison and also another story of the Little Feather, uh, a lovely lady who's actually my age, 75, but I will be 76 soon, 1st of December, so that makes Leonard Peltier two, two years older than me because he's 78 and he should never have been locked up for this length of time and they're still not letting him go, so I ask you to pray for him. But I'm now going to uh, begin the story again at the mid for those who won't have heard the Mass because they're Christian and people aren't all Christian, so... I'm just going to tell the story of Leonard Peltier's 46 years in prison. Uh, what else do you want? <laughs> uh, Mark Trahant uh, wrote this that I'm going to share because I've been um, part of um, Native American uh, platforms, listening to them over the many, many years, and I still receive emails and I look at their history and what, how well they're doing, some of them. So I'm going to begin with a prayer as I always do with my videos. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom his love commits me here, ever this day be at my side to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Holy Michael Archangel, defend me in this day of battle. Be my safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, I humbly pray, and do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan and all the wicked evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Uh, I've got three uh, stories I'm going to share. The first one's on Leonard Peltier, the second one is on the Little Feather, and the third is briefly about the education of the uh, younger uh, Native American peoples, which is, some of them are doing very well, praise the Lord. So, Leonard Peltier's 46 years in prison. What else do they want? Former federal judge said, Leonard Peltier remains a casualty of this country's cruel and lawless war against American Indians. He said that. Mark Trant, 23 hours ago. AP file, Leonard Peltier, at the US Penitentiary at Leavenworth, Can Peltier, Turtle Mountain, Band of Chippewa, is now at a prison in Florida sometime and is requesting clemency from President Joe Biden, the Kansas City star that was in. And these are the words of Mark Trahant, Indian uh, newspaper. Leonard Peltier's name has become a story that reflects other stories. One narrative describes Peltier as America's longest political prisoner, serving more than 46 years in a federal maximum security prison. In that telling, Peltier has become a humanitarian and a 78-year-old Turtle Mountain elder who has been incarcerated for far too long. I couldn't have bared at most of my lifetime to be in a prison, especially innocently. There is a long list of people, tribes and organisations that have called for Peltier's freedom. The former prosecutor in the case, members of Congress, Amnesty International USA, Pope John Francis, the Dalai Lama, the National Congress of American Indians, dozens of tribal nations, including 
Leonard Peltier's own tribe, the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, and as of this month, the Democratic National Committee. That is just one version. There is a contrary account which casts Peltier, untruthfully in my opinion, as the lead character for the crimes committed by the American Indian movement during the Wounded Knee era. I've seen many videos on that over the years. Including internal community violence. And he, this is a lie, is described as a remorseless murderer. He's not actually in prison for murder. That last story is still promoted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They did a lot of dishonest things in cohoot with some Native Americans who were gaining from financial gains. There was a lot of stuff going on way back in the 70s, I'm talking. But, but Leonard Peltier and the Bureau keep that on there website that 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 lying information but Peltier is not in prison for murder the government could not justify a murder case there wasn't any evidence so it switched gears and today Leonard Peltier is inmate hash 89637132 serving at the United States penitentiary Coleman in central Florida on charges 46 plus years of aiding and abetting no proof the murder of federal officers plus a seven year sentence for an escape attempt indeed Leonard Peltier has already served a longer sentence than most principals in murder convictions. There is no way to look at the evidence and come away with any conclusion other than Leonard Peltier is being punished for crimes that could not be proven beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law. Support Indigenous journal journalism. I do uh, support, well I try, but I don't have much of an income. So I, this way I can help. Kevin Sharp is a national Nashville attorney and a former US District Court judge who is actually representing Peltier pro bono with a petition to President Joe Biden calling for clemency. That petition requests the role of the United States government saying the FBI redoubled their efforts to secure a conviction, including dropping other charges so that the weight of the federal government could be directed against Leonard Peltier. One of the problems is that even if guilty, Peltier, Leonard, has already overserved. He has overserved any sentence he should have, Sharp said. You got your pound of flesh, if that is what you wanted. You got a guy who was there, and you. He is now 78 years old. I'll soon be 76, so I'd hate to have been locked up. What, from the 70s till now? Oh, my goodness me. And he has got 46 years behind bars. 
This is awful. Excuse me a moment. I've got a cold. <laughs> yes, it's terrible. He's he's got more than a cold though, poor man. So what else do they want? Except for him to die, die in prison. And we stopped talking about him that way. But that is the worst thing that can happen because now you do not start stop talking about him. And now you've got this guy that you allowed to die in prison. It gets louder, not softer. Over the years, the government first said that Leonard Peltier shot the agents. I've seen video after video on, on the actual happening. Then later, the prosecution switched the story to we do not know who killed the agent, but we know Leonard was there, Sharp said. OK, congratulations. There were 40 other people there with weapons. There were lots of other people there that day. There were... 150 agents, government agents there. One of them, the government agents, killed Joe Stunts, S-T-U-N-T-Z, a 21-year-old native boy. We don't know who killed him. We know it was one of the agents that they never went to figure it out. So those are the facts that we know. And if that case was tried today, there is no way it stands. Sharp said that Leonard Peltier's trial would not stand scrutiny today. There are not even two sides, he said. We know that the witnesses were intimidated. We know that the witnesses were threatened. We know that affidavits, knowingly false affidavits, were submitted to the courts. These are all facts. We know that when the trial took place and the prosecutor said, we only have one piece of evidence, one, and the man is locked up for over 46 years. That's awful. One piece of evidence, this shell casing. This ties Leonard to this shooting. We know now that they knew that that wasn't even true. And we only learned years later, after his conviction, that there had been a ballistic test that showed that it was not his weapon, not Leonard Peltier's weapon. In the White House petition, Sharp argues that Peltier remains a casualty of this country's cruel and lawless war against American Indians. His continued incarceration, moreover, is a constant reminder to the native communities that they are disposable in the eyes of the US government and unworthy of the most basic protections afforded by the American Constitution. It is the failure of basic constitutional protections that power Sharp's message. He left the federal bench because of what he saw as structural issues in the criminal justice system. And these are his words. I was forced, because of mandatory minimums, to sentence a young man to two life sentences 
Sharp recalled. It was very frustrating to me because in order to become a federal judge, you are vetted and investigated by the FBI. Vetted and investigated by the White House, the Department of Justice, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and they have their own investigators, all for one reason. And that is to satisfy themselves that you have the intellect and the temperament and the judgment to rule on these most important items in our country. And that is dealing with somebody's liberty. Sharp sent Chris Young to prison. Excuse me, I have a terrible bit of a cold. I apologise, I'm sorry. I can't edit the video either, I'm no good at that. Sharp sent Chris Young to prison and that crossed a line for him. So, after six years, as a federal judge, Sharp shifted gears and set out to defend justice. And he went on to say, That led me to the Trump Oval Office and working with Kim Kardashian to help free this young man. His name was Chris Young and Chris is free today. We actually were able to secure clemency. It was in that context that Sharp became interested in Leonard Peltier. He received a package from Connie Nelson, the former wife of Willie Nelson and he said and I sat down with this package and it was the trial transcripts from Leonard's trial. He said it was newspaper articles, court opinions, photographs and I just started going through it and he said I'm sucked in. Sharp saw holes in the government story and he said it was easy for me to see what happened the misconduct by the prosecutors by the investigators the rulings by the court that would never stand today because the standard of review is different all of that was easy for me, he said. That what then has sucked me in for years since I first opened that package is the why. Why did they do that? Why? Why are there so many constitutional violations? What was going on? And what led to this point? Well, there's only one word, racism against Native American Indians who were there when everyone went there to live and take their land and property and values. It was the context. That is what sucked me into this, he said, and has aggravated me, has, you know, made me angry, made me sad made me confused. What are we doing? And why are we here? And that is why Leonard Peltier is so important. This is not about people with guns on Pine Ridge, you know, South Dakota, on June the 26th, 1975. That is part of it. But the real story is the why. 
And as one of the courts said, in one of the court opinions, the United States government needs to take responsibility for what happened there that day. I personally, sitting here, have seen all of those real-life videos that were taken at that time, as well as the other stories that have been created since. I've seen the real what was going on. All the helicopters and all the stuff and all the... In, in, it, it, it's still in my head. And Sharp said, there is no way that Leonard Peltier's trial would meet today's minimum standards of justice. Well, it's obvious to anyone who's followed the stories and who's seen the footage, all of it, and heard all the conversations. Long, long time, many, many people worldwide know that this is just the government spitefulness, not about justice, just about the Indians and the Americans, you know, the old Wild West stuff being relived and rehashed and putting them down and putting them down and putting them down. That's not what I'm reading, but that's my opinion. In 1986, the 8th US Court of Appeals found that the government had failed to disclose evidence favourable to Leonard Peltier. And this is what is known as the Brady Violation. And it is enough to require a new trial. Probably uh, nearly all the witnesses and people from that time are dead as well. But in Leonard Peltier's case, the rule was ignored. The district court held that the October the 2nd, and we're now on the 1st of October 2022, first, today, Saturday, 1st of October, and I'm talking about something that happened in 1975 when I was expecting my fourth child, James. Yeah, born in April 76. So I was, yeah, I was expecting then. Teletype evaluated in the context of the end, and he's 46, in the context of the entire record would not have affected the outcome of the trial and that therefore Leonard Peltier was not entitled to relief. Or consider the story, and this is a very interesting one, I've read it already, the story of a self-proclaimed racist juror should never have been allowed to be on the jury. Three women in Fargo slipped a note to the trial judge, Paul Benson, that said they were friends with the juror. And she told them that she was really prejudiced against Indians. The judge asks her about the statement Yep, I said it. But I told you when you were asking me questions that I would set any prejudice I had. I'd be fair. The judge says, Thank you very much. And the trial continued on and juror number 10 voted guilty. That fact alone would be enough to reverse a trial. If that happened today, he gets a new trial, Sharp said. So it is those things that drive me crazy. When I talk about look, I believe in the Constitution. Those are all constitutional violations we get a new trial, he said. The government's prosecutors changed their theory in 1985 after Leonard 
Peltier's conviction. As the prosecutor Lynn Crooks told the appeals court, we cannot prove who shot those agents. Thus, Leonard Peltier was not actually convicted of murder. Instead, he has been in prison since 1977 on aiding and abetting the murder of federal officers. He wasn't anywhere near being able to hit them and kill them. That was proven in the films that I've seen. Another former prosecutor in the case, James Reynolds, has called for clemency in a letter to the president. Reynolds wrote that with the benefit of hindsight, I have realised that the prosecution and continued incarceration of Mr Leonard Peltier was and is unjust. We were not able to prove that Mr Leonard Peltier personally committed any offence on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Let me repeat that. And we were not able to prove that Mr Leonard Peltier personally committed any offence on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Yet he's been locked up for over 46 years before my son was born. One other story told about Leonard Peltier is not directly related to his aiding and betting conviction and that is the tie to Anna May Aquash murder investigation. The American Indian movement at first, at first, blamed the FBI for Anna May Aquash's murder in February of 1976. But later information surfaced that she was murdered by AIM, A-I-M, because she was suspected of being an, inform an informer. A. Quash's family said, they said, mate, Leonard Peltier was involved and was aware of her killer. Two former AIM members, Ario Looking Cloud and John Graham, were convicted of killing A. Quash. Sharp points out that Leonard Peltier has never been charged in connection with Aquash. In a statement this week, Thalia Carol Kachimuel, Executive Director of the International Leonard Peltier Defence Committee, said there has been an extraordinary volume of misinformation spread regarding Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier's conviction and perverse length of his incarceration are emblematic of the racist mistreatment of American Indians by law enforcement that existed throughout Indian country for decades. If there is evidence that has never before been produced, then we encourage its unveiling. If the true motive is justice, if the motive is simply to support Mr. 
Peltier's unjust imprisonment, the bar must be set higher. Peltier's petition for clemency will be up to President Biden. And has he got all his faculties? Just this month, a resolution enacted by the Democratic National Committee said the party's platform already says the president should use clemency to secure the release of those serving unduly long sentences. And in Leonard Peltier's case, given the overwhelming support for clemency, the constitutional due process issues underlying Mr. Leonard Peltier's prosecution, his status as an elderly inmate, and that he is an American Indian who suffers from greater rates of health disparities and severe underlying health conditions. Mr. Peltier is a good candidate to be granted mercy and leniency and it is highly appropriate that consideration of clemency for Mr Peltier be prioritised and expediated so that Mr Leonard Peltier can return to his family and live his final years among his people. It sounds to me like history repeating itself with some of the elder um, in the early days of, of the wars between the Native Americans and, 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 and the governmental people and the things that they did. So many of their wonderful leaders died mercilessly and were murdered as well um, by them because they didn't they didn't like the power and the influence that they had on their people this is not the first time they've done it many times in the history of the native americans because i've been following them for years all their stories and in leonard peltier's petition it says the time for clemency is now because, sadly, his health is fading. Leonard suffers from a variety of ailments, including kidney disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, a heart condition, bone spurs in his feet, a degenerative joint disease, constant shortness of breath and dizziness and painful injuries to his jaw. No doubt a few people whacked him in there, there over time. A stroke in 1986 left Leonard virtually blind in one eye. The clemency petition says, prison doctors advised Leonard that the condition required surgery, but the maxipan Security prison where he is incarcerated does not have the capacity to treat the condition. Leonard's physical condition is dire and he cannot physically defend himself in prison, let alone threaten anyone with harm. No one my age, age group can do anything to anyone. I look at the Old men who live in this building, they can just about walk their little dogs to that and have a little walk about, and they the dogs walk better than them. <laughs> North Dakota State Representative Ruth Buffalo, Mandan Hidatsa Arikara, brought the resolution forward 
at the September DNC meeting. She said it started with a coordinated message from a variety of state legislators and the North Dakota Democratic Nonpartisan League Party. That was followed by a similar call from the Native American Caucus of Native American state legislators. All that built toward the DNC resolution. Buffalo represents Fargo in the legislature, the city where Leonard Peltier's trial originally took place. She said has heard from the constituents, regardless of party affiliation, supporting clemency because of the constitutional violations. One thing that has kept us going is so many of us, unfortunately, have relatives and loved ones who are currently in the criminal justice system or who have thankfully made it out of serving time behind bars, she said. And so Leonard Peltier's long prison time is something of an issue that definitely hits home for many of us. He's not the only one wrongly incarcerated. She said, Leonard Peltier should come home. I know there are so many people who have been praying, and I'm one of them, since the 70s for Leonard's release. Buffalo said, and so we know that there are many grandmas and elder women at Turtle Mountain who pray for Leonard on a daily basis. Hallelujah. This whole case is a reflection of injustice, she said, and it must be resolved in order to heal communities. She said, Leonard's release is one sure way to make sure that we are on a path towards healing. This article was by Mark Trahant, Shoshon Bannock, and it's Indian CT's editor at large. He's on Twitter at Trahant Reports, and Trahant is based in Phoenix. The Indigenous Economics Project is funded with a major grant from the Bay and Paul Foundations. So that's the end of that story on um, Leonard Peltier. But I have another interesting one that I want to include. And this is um, Sashen Littlefeather. She has no regrets. And she received an apology from the Academy of motion pictures recognizes her historic role in bringing change to the film industry plus correction diana hunt september the 15th 2022 i'm going to read about this lovely little actress she's now she's my age now but you will you you my age group you'll remember this actress and activist sasheen littlefeather was just 26 years old when she stunned the Academy Awards in 1973. Sadly, that was the day, year my dad died. By rejecting the Best Actor Oscar on behalf of Marlon Brando because of the injustices in the way Indigenous people were treated in the film and television industries. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences apologised to her in June 2022 for the mistreatment she suffered after the speech. And there's a photo in, the, in, in here of the Globe Photos Zuma Press by the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. This is written by Diana Hunt. Still there. Excuse me a moment. I have a cold. 
and I'll describe it in her words. It was a quiet protest, delivered as Sasheen Littlefeather lived her life with dignity, grace, compassion, she was very beautiful, and honesty, the way her ancestors would have wanted. But the calm words delivered to the Academy Awards on March 27th, 1973, on behalf of actor Marlon Brando, focused the world's attention on the plight of the indigenous people in a way that had never been done before. As the first indigenous woman ever to stand at the podium at the Academy Awards, she put a spotlight on the inhumanity stereotypes, disrespect and derision. Excuse me a moment, I'm sorry, but I have a very bad cold. <laughs> that indigenous people faced in film and television and brought also the Wounded Knee protest to an international audience because at that time it was still only local America. And these are her little feathers words. I did not go up there in protest with an up in the air fist with profanity with a loud screeching voice. Little Feather, now 75, my age, oh bless her, Apache and Yakwi told Indian ICT in a recent interview, the way that I went up on stage was prompted by my ancestors. I prayed that my words would meet not with deaf ears, but with open hearts and open minds. Instead, her speech drew boos, insults, slurs, war whoops, tomahawk chops, and threats of arrest. And actor John Wayne reportedly tried to charge the stage to remove her. In the days and weeks that followed, she was ostracised professionally as well, putting a damper on her acting career. It did not stop her. She went on to become a traditional nutritionist, working to help people and educate the health industry about indigenous medicine. She co-founded the American Indian AIDS Institute in San Francisco, worked with Mother Teresa and pushed for the canonization of Kateria Tekawitha, the first native woman to become a Catholic saint. I read about her life as well. Then in June, nearly 50 years after the landmark speech came a final response she had not expected a formal apology from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences billed as a letter of reconciliation the Film Academy finally apologises to Satch Sasheen Littlefeller. As you stood on the Oscars stage in 1973, wrote then Academy President David Rubin, you made a powerful statement that continues to remind us of the necessity of respect and the importance of human dignity. The abuse you endured because of this statement was unwarranted and unjustified. The emotional burden you have lived through 
and the cost to your own career in our industry is are irreparable. For too long, the courage you showed has been unacknowledged. For this, we offer both our deepest apologies and our sincere admiration. Little Feather is set to appear in an evening with Sasheen Little Feather on Saturday, September the 17th, already gone, at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures with Bird Running Water, Cheyenne and Mescalero Apache, who now heads the Academy's Indigenous Alliance. The event, billed as a conversation of reflection, healing and celebration, was free, but no seats remained available. It marks a new era for the ca Academy, Reuben said. That's David Reuben. And uh, today, nearly 50 years later, and with the guidance of the Academy's Indigenous Alliance, we are firm in our commitment to ensuring Indigenous voices. The original storytellers are visible, respected contributors to the global film community, he wrote. We are dedicated to fostering a more inclusive, respectful industry that leverages a balance of art and activism to be a driving force for progress, he said. We hope you receive this letter in the spirit of reconciliation and as recognition of your essential role in our journey as an organisation. You are forever respectfully ingrained in our history. Little Feather was shocked. I never expected anything like this, she told ICT, and I'm glad that I'm still alive to receive it. Fast Friends with Marlon Brando. Now, this is an interest for all the Marlon Brando fans, which I was always one. Brando was the favourite to win the Oscar in 1973 for Best Actor for his performance in The Godfather, which drew a slew of nominations, including for Best Picture. By then, Brando had been outspoken in his support of Indigenous people and the injustices they faced. The occupation of Alcatraz, I watched that as well, had drawn attention to the American Indian movement and a protest at Wounded Knee had just begun. And he had no intentions of accepting an Oscar so he arranged for his little friend, his friend Little Feather, to go in his place, refusing to accept the award on his behalf in protest of the ill treatment of indigenous people in the film industry. He made Little Feather promise that, that she would not even touch the statuette, and she agreed. Little Feather met Brando through an odd set of coincidences. At the time, she lived in California, near the home of Francis Ford Coppola, director of The Godfather, and often saw him sitting on his porch as she walked through the hills near San Francisco. When she heard Brando speak out about indigenous issues, she wrote a letter to him to find out if he was sincere. With Coppola's help, it was delivered. She had been involved with the American Indian movement's occupation of Alcatraz in 1969 to 1971 
and been active with other indigenous organizations. She did not get an immediate response to the letter, however, until months later, when she received a call one night at the San Francisco radio station where she worked as public service director. I bet you don't know who this is, the caller said, according to a documentary about her life. Sashin breaking the silence. She recognised him immediately and chided him for taking so long to respond. You beat Indian time all to hell, she said. They became fast friends. As the 45th Academy Awards approached, Brando asked her to take his place at the ceremony and he wrote a lengthy statement that he asked her to read if he won. By then, Little Feather was a member of the Screen Actors Guild and was president of the National Native American Affirmative Image Committee. That night, however, the show's executive producer saw her holding the eight-page typed statement and threatened to have her arrested if she spoke more than 60 seconds, she said. When Brando was announced as the winner, she stepped up to the podium wearing a beaded buckskin dress, moccasins and beaded hair ties, the clothes she wore to powwows. She refused to take the statuette from presenters Liv Ullman and Roger Moore and improvised a speech based on what Brando had wanted. I am representing Marlon Brando this evening and he has asked me to tell you in a very long speech which I cannot share with you presently because of time but I will be glad to share with the press afterwards that he very regretfully cannot accept this very generous award, she said. And the reasons for this being are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry, excuse me, and on television, in movie reruns, and also with recent happenings at Wounded Knee, she said. I beg at this time that I have not intruded upon this evening and that we will in the future, our hearts and our understandings, will meet with love and generosity. Thank you, on behalf of Marlon Brando. She was escorted off stage to meet with the media, then returned to Brando's home. He told me I did well, she said. He was proud of me. The speech created an uproar, but there were cheers at Wounded Knee, where AIM leaders Oren Lyons, Russell Means, oh, he was wonderful, I loved listening to his videos, rest in peace, Russell Means, and Dennis Banks was several weeks into the occupation. They had gotten early word from Brando that something was up, she said. The publicity brought an onslaught of media from around the world to Wounded Knee, where the standoff, which was a long one, would continue for more than two months. They were so happy at Wounded Knee, she said. So life after the 1973 Academy Awards, Little Feather did not give up on the film industry after delivering her speech at the Academy Awards at just 26 years old. She attended classes at the American... She should have been 23, not 26, because I think I was 23 when my dad died, but that was 73. I think they've made a mistake here. I don't know. I'll check it later. 
She attended classes at the American Conservatory Theatre in 1974 and appeared in several films over the next few years, including an uncredited performance in Freebie and the Bean in 1974. She appeared in the 1975... I've seen this film loads of times. She appeared in the 1975 movie Winterhawk, filmed in Montana, in the 1975 film Johnny Firecloud, and the 1978 film Shoot the Sun Down, and toured with the Red Earth Theatre Company. But pressure was also placed on film studios and directors not to include her in productions, part of a documented effort in the 1970s to blacklist native people who supported the AIM movement and other indigenous causes. A series of health issues including a lung collapse at age 29, encouraged her interest in health care. She received a degree from Antioch University in holistic health and nutrition with an emphasis on indigenous medicine and worked with a number of universities and health care organisations to spread the importance of incorporating indigenous medicine into mainstream medicine and she said I have never carried hate inside my heart for anyone I never had a grudge against the Academy Awards she said I was talented as a young person and I had a lot going for myself you accept what is she helped found the American Indian AIDS Institute in San Francisco and served as a board member and as secretary in 1988. She also worked with the Gift of Love AIDS Hospice in San Francisco, which was founded by Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And she remained active in California's indigenous community, fighting against indigenous mascots and holding prayer circles for the canonization for Kateri, Tekawitha and on Algonquin and Mohawk women from the 1600s who converted to Catholicism after being severely scarred by smallpox. Tekawitha was beatified by Pope John Paul II in 1980 and canonised by Pope Benedict XVI in 2012. In 1989, she married Charles Koshiwe, an Oto from Oklahoma. She said they were very much in sync and danced frequently at powwows. They had been married for 32 years when he died. How sad. November 2021. Rest in peace to her husband Charles. In 2018, she was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. She told The Guardian in 2021 that the cancer had metastasized to a lung and that she was terminally ill. And she said, I will have a plot next to him when it is my time to go to the spirit world, she told ICT, long ago wishes. And today, Little Feather lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with occasional help from a niece who calls her auntie. She was caught off guard by a visit in June, from Jacqueline Stewart, director and president of the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, who arrived for a taping session with what she said were two presents. The first gift 
was a photo of the museum exhibit of Little Feather's speech at the 1973 awards ceremony. The exhibit holds a place of honour at the museum next to an exhibit of Sidney Poitier, who in 1964 became the first black actor to receive an Academy Award as Best Actor, and he did deserve it. The other gift, Stuart said, was the apology letter from the Academy. And she said, I never thought anything like this would ever happen in my whole lifetime, she told ICT. This is an apology that is being given to all Native peoples, not just to me, myself and I, but to we, us and our. My response was on behalf of all of us who suffered years and years of humiliation, of poor self-esteem, because of the stereotyping of our people, having to live under the stereotypes of the film and television and sports industries. The apology fulfills the wishes she made long ago. And this is what she said. I prayed that I would walk with dignity and honour the way our Indian women have done throughout the ages, she said. This is my tribute to all Indian women, past and present. The truth lives on throughout the test of time, and this apology represents that. In recent years, she has relished the changes in the industry with Buffy Santi Marie winning an Oscar in 1983 for the best original song for Up Where We Belong, for an officer and a gentleman, with Sterling Harjo winning acclaim for the series Reservation Dogs, and the success of Rutherford Falls and other productions. She delights in seeing the roles of Native American women and other Indigenous actors, producers and directors and hopes she contributed to the changes. The doors are open now for Native people in a way that they were not when I was younger, she said. To see the doors open up little by little is a dream for me come true. If I did anything to help in that direction, I am more than gratified. And she has no regrets about the life, the path her life has taken. When I was young and gorgeous back in the day, I promised myself I'd never be bored, she said. And I never have been. Uh, correction, David Rubin is past president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, his name was misspelled in an earlier version of the stories. So ICT are a great newspaper. I highly recommend them. And I want briefly to tell you a little bit about the education. 50th anniversary, 1971 to 2021. Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute. Deb Hallan celebrates decades of indige indigenous education. The Southwestern Indian Polytech Institute has educated thousands of indigenous students in its 50 years of operation. Kali Ben Ali, September the 21st, 2022. Interior Secretary Deb Halland, Bureau of Indian Education, Director Tony Demon and SIPI President Dr. Tamara Pfeiffer at the Southwestern Indian Polytech Institute, 50th anniversary commemoration on September the 20th, 2022. This is by Kali Benali, Albuquerque NM, Interior Secretary, Deb Halland, and Bureau of Indian Education Director, Tony Dearman, 
visited the Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute on Tuesday to commemorate the school's 50th anniversary. The school opened in 1971. During its decade of operation, over 36,000 Indigenous students have attended SLPI and over 2,700 degrees have been awarded, representing 260 tribes. The school offers a variety of post-secondary training programmes, from vision care technology to early childhood education to accounting. SIPI impacts Indian country by educating Native Americans from across the United States who can return to their communities and fulfill the education and workforce needs in their tribal nations, Dearman Cherokee said. The Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute is one of two post-secondary institutions operated by the Bureau of Indian Education. The Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas is the other. Haland Laguna Pueblo said she visited SIPI many times, one of which is when she helped her cousin move in the year the school opened. As a leader in Indian education, SIPI has become an integral place for Indigenous students to receive culturally competent education. She said it is an institution that represents the fight and resistance to the long-standing assimilation efforts our people have faced in this country since the dawn of colonisation. Halland's visit also occurred on the same day as National Voter Registration Day. It was announced in March that the Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute will serve as a voter registration agency. The school will educate students and give access to voter registration and election information. This may seem like a small step, but this is one way we can honour those who fought hard for the rights we have today. Hallan said, participatory democracy is part of who we are as people. Collaboration, consensus and common good are built into our cultures and our traditions. Hallan emphasised the importance voc voting has on selecting leadership that understands indigenous communities and sovereignty. No effort is too small, she said. Even our most basic actions, like voting, make all the difference in honouring our ancestors and supporting our communities. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you all. I'm sending you the peace of Christ, and may you always be happy and joyful in the Lord, our Creator of heaven and earth. And let's bless our indigenous people all over the world and protect them from racism and spread the stories and the truth. That's what we must do. Wherever we are, we have to support. We're all equal in the eyes of God and he loves all of us. He created us all in his likeness and image. Thank you. Sending you peace and love. God bless. Thank you for listening.